she still left a really big impression on me. I think when you hear her talk, you'll see that she really cares about her students and is super successful and just an all-around great contribution to our field. So she is currently the Vice Dean of New Initiatives at the School of Engineering um, at University of Southern California or USC. She's also the Ray Irani Professor of Chemical Engineering and Material Science and the Director of the John D. O'Brien Nanofabrication Labor Laboratory at USC. So I think just a lot of cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary work goes on, so this should be a really interesting talk. And thank you guys for sticking around. And <laughs> what else can I say? There's an article that she wrote on SPIE that's like how to write a good research paper, and there's like, I think, 10 steps. Um, it's really good. I really like it. There's a cute little cartoon, so I don't know if you like cartoons. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, it's really good. Um, I started getting questions about, uh, you know, are all the students in the same field? So now I put them in little boxes so you can see exactly how spread out they are across all the different fields. Um, and as you can see, they are kind of equally distributed among a lot of different areas. So they are, you know, equally balanced when we have Lab Olympics in terms of, you know, representing their discipline. Um, and, oh yes, I'm hiring two postdocs. Uh, so if you have friends or if you yourself are graduating in like the fall to the next winter, sometime anywhere in that time frame, you know, you should reach out. So I'm just gonna, gonna toss that out there. Um, and the, the full ad is on my group webpage. Um, so our group, we kind of work in a lot of different areas, but the big picture is we work on developing new types of materials that we then use in uh, new types of integrated on-chip optics like waveguides and resonators. And then some of those devices matriculate all the way into becoming larger scale systems. Um, and then obviously we also will take some of our materials and actually use them directly as like imaging agents or to make uh, dynamic materials that we can use in imaging systems. But for the most part, it's, it's a lot of integrated optics and like optical materials for integrated optics, which is why there's the chemists and the physicists and the electrical engineers, because they all work nicely together most of the time. Um, Everybody, just so you know, everybody coming back from COVID, if it seems like a little bumpy, it's because people have forgotten how to work together. Um, so it's, it's, it's not you. It's really everybody's forgotten how to work together. Um, so we all, we all need to start doing that more. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about some of the resonator work we've done, why, why the type of resonator we use are particularly useful for looking at surface interactions, and then how we're modifying the surface uh, to actually make uh, active devices out of uh, a silica device, which is normally more of a passive type device. And seeing as I know it's 5 p.m., uh, if you have questions as I'm going along, you should please, please, please interrupt me and ask. I would rather not make it to the end, but actually get questions from all of you instead of, you know, just barreling through and having all of you fall asleep. Um, although you probably had lots of coffee and muffins at this point. Uh, yes, raise your hand. Just go for it. Or shout out, but really honestly, go for it. Um, okay, so... We work on whispering gallery mode optical cavities, which were named after the acoustic phenomena. Um, so you have a orbiting optical wave as opposed to an acoustic wave. Um, they were first demonstrated in the suspended oil droplets. Uh, the reason why they were actually possible in these suspended oil droplets was because of the optical trap. So Ashkin and Chu in the 80s. So once the optical trap was created, then the suspended optical drops were possible, and then optical whispering gallery modes were able to be demonstrated. So you know, it's kind of an example of how you know, one discovery and innovation leads to you know, many, many, many other discoveries in completely different fields. Um, but once uh, a lot of discoveries had been made in this suspended droplet, uh, engineers started looking around for ways to make something that's a little bit more stable. Uh, because droplets, you can't really integrate onto a chip. 
And so kind of the first baby step was to move into a silica device, and that's where the silica microsphere cavity came about. So to make a silica microsphere, you just take some optical fiber, melt the end of it with a flame or a CO2 laser, and you end up with a silica microsphere. And at least that's solid state, you know, you can wave it around. Um, it doesn't evaporate in the sun. Uh, but, you know, it's made out of silica, and that has its own limitations in terms of operating wavelength, in terms of diameter. And so in the last uh, 20 years or so, there have been just a huge growth of possible material systems, fabrication technologies that have enabled the same kind of concept of a ring type or circular type resonant cavity, but made out of a lot of different materials. And as you make them out of new material systems, then that opens up the door to a whole host of wavelengths from the UV all the way to the mid-IR. So depending on what wavelength you want, that kind of dictates your material. But then also even within a given wavelength, if you look at using silicon versus lithium niobate, with lithium niobate you can get some uh, triggerability, let's say, um, whereas silicon is a little bit harder. So just having all of these different options now, you have this you know, great toolkit to play with. And as a result, you know, these devices have been used in a lot of different applications. They've been used in telecom, diagnostics, quantum, nonlinear optics, so a lot of different places. And one reason why, they're, why I think they're so much fun um, is because first, you start off with just this very, very, very simple way to tell if you have a good device or not. So, you know, when you have your device and you're, you do your first measurement, you can quickly say, I'm going to keep moving forward down this measurement path or I'm just going to put it in the garbage. Um, and that was actually one of my, like, one of my deciding factors when choosing to do a PhD in a field is I wanted to be able to have that quick feedback. Like, should I keep doing this or should this device go in the garbage? And I wanted that turnaround time to be, like, days, not months or years. Uh, and so for these devices, you can, the first kind of metric is something called the quality factor, or Q. And you measure the Q by simply measuring the line width of the cavity, and that's that delta lambda. And you put the resonant wavelength divided by that full width half max, or delta lambda. Um, there are other ways that you can measure the quality factor. And the other most common is to do something called a ring down, or cavity ring down measurement. In a ring down measurement, you put in kind of like a single pulse of light, and then you measure how long it takes for that light to decay or ring down out of the cavity. Um, there are kind of two limitations to both measurements, to both measurement approaches. So with a ring down method, that ring down time or that photon decay time out of the cavity needs to be long enough that you can actually record it on an oscilloscope. So if your cavity quality factor or photon storage time in the cavity is too short, you can't actually measure it. So if you have a, a low Q, like a poor Q, uh, then you actually can't do ring down, right? Or it's extremely technically challenging to do ring down. And there's really no point because you can do a line width measurement. On the other hand, if your cavity Q is exceptionally high, and by exceptionally high I mean like a billion, um, then, in order to actually measure or resolve that cavity line width, your probe laser that's actually doing the measurement needs to be narrower than the line width of your resonant cavity. And now you're talking, you need an ultra, ultra, ultra narrow line width tunable laser, and they actually kind of sort of don't exist. Uh, so that's when cavity ring down comes into play. Fibers to send the light in and then measure what comes out? So right now I'm talking in broad strokes. I use tapered fibers. That is very true. But for these, type, for these two types of methods, you don't necessarily have to use tapered fibers. Why else would you measure the Q? So, uh, for example, if you're using, if you're doing like the diamond, cavities or the silicon nitride or the silicon, they also measure cues and they use bus waveguides, not tapered fibers. So the, the tapered fiber right, is just the coupler, it's just how you actually get light into the cavity, but the cue is an intrinsic property of the cavity. So the... And then the same light comes out of the other end of the fiber also. 
Yes. It, it, and that's, that's also true with these as well. Um, the advantage of the tapered fiber uh, it actually has two advantages. So one advantage is that uh, you can very precisely control the distance between your tapered fiber and your resonator. Um, so that allows you to, like, in real time, control the amount of power that you're coupling into your cavity. So then, you know, during an experiment, if you decide you want to change that, the amount of light you're coupling in, you, you can do that. Whereas with a system like that, uh, obviously it's fixed. You can't change that. It's, you have what you have. Um, the other advantage is that tapered fibers are something called lossless couplers. They aren't, I mean, there's no such thing as something being lossless, um, but they are extremely low loss couplers. Uh, when you actually measure a quality factor, do I have a picture of one? I actually have a cartoon. So when you actually measure a quality factor like that, the loaded quality factor is comprised of both the intrinsic losses, which are intrinsic to the cavity, and the extrinsic losses. And those extrinsic losses are the coupling losses. So if you have a lossless coupler, or, or at least a coupler that has minimal losses, then your, the Q that you measure is going to be the same as your intrinsic Q. So it simplifies everything. It just makes your life easier. So that's the that's a good thing about tapered fibers. There's a really long list of bad things. I can I can I can talk for a really long time about the bad things. Uh, yeah, that that's for dinner um, when I'm not being recorded. Okay, so that my funding stays intact. Um, okay, so there's uh, yes. Yeah, so the reason why Q is a useful metric that can be used for that that sorting is because Q is kind of a first sign indicator on if a device will actually be useful to study a nonlinear phenomena, right? So, will the device have a really high circulating power? Will the device have a high circulating intensity? Um, because a lot of the other metrics are kind of a given, so like you can calculate what the mode volume will be, and that's not necessarily an experimental parameter. It's, it's going to be fixed. Um, so, but the Q is going to be an experimental variable. So like if we know we have a high Q, then we know we will have a high circulating power, and then we should move on with the experiment. If the Q is low, then we're going to throw it away. And it is truly a variable. So even like all of the devices where they say, you know, like, oh, we got a you know, 100 million Q in this device, the, your immediate follow-up question should be, what is your yield? Because the yield is not 100 out of 100. Okay, um, but all of these general types of structures, like rings, toroids, spheres, and disks, have all gotten above 100 million Q. But note, I don't have any material systems listed. So for example, uh, micro disks made out of silicon nitride and micro disks made out of silica have gotten above 100 million at this point, but micro disks made out of like um, in gas have not, or uh, indium phosphide have not, um, but they're getting close. And so it really, it also depends on the wavelength, right? If you have a silica micro disk in the visible, sure. Um, if you take that same silica micro disk and operate it in the mid IR, it's going to not have a Q. Um, because it's just not going to be able to store light at all. So all of these quality factor metrics are also wavelength dependent, and that's also something that's usually never said, right? It's because your cavity Q is going to be specific to a wavelength. Um, it's not a wavelength agnostic term. That's also a pet peeve of mine. You just like spew out a Q, but it's dependent on the wavelength you're operating. Uh, so using these devices, uh, you can look at a lot of different nonlinear behaviors. Today we're going to mostly focus on Raman, but you can look at a lot of different things. Um, so continuing with a little bit of the history lesson for like two more slides. Um, one of the first examples of using this type of silica device to make a Raman laser uh, was with both microspheres and microtorids. Uh, the reason why this was kind of a very surprising finding uh, was because the Raman gain coefficient of silica is really, really low. Um, so the idea that you would actually be able to get lasing was very surprising. Uh, but if you look at the threshold power equation, you can see that the Raman gain is in the denominator, which would make you think that you would need a ton of power. Um, however, the quality factor term is also in the denominator, and Q is squared. 
In other words, if you have a really high Q, then you can overcome that really, really bad gain factor and then have a similarly low threshold power. Um, so if you look at the spectra um, for the sphere and the toroid device, they were able to get uh, sub-milliwatt thresholds as long as their Qs in both cases were above 100 million. However, while a really high Q is able to overcome that low threshold, it does nothing for the lasing efficiency. Um, so the lasing efficiency for both of these devices and like all devices of this ilk are in the sub 10% range. So not great. Um, so they may have low threshold, but their efficiency isn't awesome. Um, so I wanted to see if we could do something similar, but with higher efficiency. Right. So, so this is where surface interactions begin to come into play. Uh, so this is an SEM, then a FEM, and then like an intensity profile. So the SEM is just highlighting the actual resonator part of the resonator. Um, it's colored. My student colored it. I really dislike them, but I was told it makes it easier to understand. So te technically he's not a student anymore but I, I'm not calling out names. Um, so then uh, if you take and do a finite element method model of the TE mode of the toroid, obviously where it's blue, no, no field, red field, gradient. Um, and then if you do a cross section through there, um, you can see that while the majority of the optical mode is inside the device, there's a little bit of it that leaks out. And so there's also kind of the this evanescent tail, but also field at that silica air interface or at the surface of the device. So I began to get curious about, like, can we stick stuff at the surface? And people had been looking at putting stuff at the surface to do biosensing for a really long time. But I was interested in putting things at the surface to actually enhance the nonlinear performance of the device and maybe enhance, like, the optical properties of the device, maybe make functional devices, things like that. So something more than just, like, detecting if something's there or not, like actually make an active device. So one of the first kind of proof of concepts that we decided to explore was to see if we could take this normal silica device and make a little monolayer of like crystalline material on the surface, right? Because Raman is a vibrational phenomena and it gets its in crystalline material, it gets its efficiency from having the optical mode interacting with a structured material that has a fixed vibrational order. And because silica is amorphous, there is no order, and therefore the Raman gain is poor. But if we could create some sort of scaffold on the surface that had structure, then maybe we could bump up the Raman gain. And so we decided to try to do this using surface chemistry, and we created a monolayer on the surface that was anchored to the surface and that would have structure. Um, and we did this by using a simple silane chemistry um, on the surface of the device. Uh, and we actually looked at three, and I have to say this, even though none of you are chemists, but this is a cartoon. Um, these are cartoons. Um, I can't make it any more cartoony than I did, but they're cartoons. Okay. Um, just cartoon. Um, okay, so the first one... On the, on the left uh, is kind of the normal silica surface. So the normal silica surface presents hydroxyl groups to the environment. They, aren't, they have random angle orientation. There's, it's a disordered, disordered surface. Um, so the first surface chemistry that we explored was to replace the hydroxyl groups with uh, using a silane chemistry with a, a single methyl group while also forming a, a monolayer of uh, SiOSI bonds. And I, can I walk? I can walk with this. Okay. Um, and this bond, this SiOSI bond, is the same bond that's actually found inside our device. So all we're doing is creating a, like an organized monolayer that mimics inside, except it actually has a permanent structure. And then we use the exact same uh, chemical here that we use here, except this one had two uh, methyl groups on it. So the reason why this was exciting and interesting is because first, um, Raman is a polarization dependent behavior. And this vibrational angle is 120 degrees. It's fixed. So then depending on if we were exciting with the TE mode or the TM mode, we should actually be able to see a difference in magnitude of that emission signal, theoretically, if everything, if the stars align. 
Uh, so we decided to look at those three situations. So the first one, which is the control, and then the two different surface chemistries, because we were curious if having the thing dangling off would do something, um, and also if the density of sites would change. So this is just an overview of the chemistry for anyone who's super excited about the chemistry. Um, it's actually a very simple chemistry. One question I get a lot is why don't we get multiple layers? Uh, so this is a self-quenching chemistry. So if you look, the chlorine group interacts with the hydroxyl group, it pops off, and then you end up with the monolayer. You can't, the chlorine group does not interact with the methyl group. There is no reaction there. So you can't get multiple layers. As, as my friend's 13-year-old son says, it's not a thing. So that's, you, you, it's, it's not a thing. I did not invent this chemistry. This chemistry was invented, like, early last century. Um, I just want to, so don't question the chemistry because it's, it's like, it's not me. Um, so how we characterize them? Oh, taper fiber. I did have one in here. Okay. So um, we used, we actually did all these measurements at three different laser wavelengths. I'm going to show the 765 ones um, simply because they, they allow a lot of different things to be talked about. But we also did 1300 and 1550. Um, we had our tunable laser go through a polarization controller, which then went into uh, tapered fiber, which coupled light into and out of the resonator. Um, from there, it went into a 90-10 splitter, where 90% of the power went into the OSA and 10% went into the oscilloscope. Um, we actually don't have an oscilloscope that looks like that. We use PCI cards, which are in the computer. But showing a computer isn't nearly as visually compelling. Um, and then obviously the laser is controlled by the computer and all of that. Uh, so we also looked at two different device diameters. So we looked at a device diameter that was 53 microns and 83 microns, plus or minus a micron or so. Um, the reason why we looked at two different device diameters is because circulating power is dependent on device size. So it was important to look at two different device diameters to make sure that the effect we were seeing wasn't simply because of the device. It was actually because of that surface chemistry. So we wanted to do it at two different device sizes so we could tease out that effect as well. Um, and we did all of our measurements in triplicate. Um, so I also have like an entire bio side of my lab. So whenever we do something, we just do it in triplicate because that's, that's like the protocol in the lab. So we have some lab protocols that are like everything has to be done this way. And for the biologists, they're like, oh, OK, that makes sense. And then there's some optics things that we do that the biologists are like, this is not fair to us. Um, because they're engineering things that make total sense. And it does not make sense for them. And they get very mad. But in the end, it's fine. Everybody does the same thing. Um, so we looked at the different polarizations as well. Um, and the color scheme throughout all the rest of the graphs are going to remain the same. So the gray and the black are the normal device. The blue ones are the methyl coated, and the red ones are the dimethyl coated. So the main point of this figure is simply that the Q didn't really change with the surface coating or with the polarization, which was kind of our goal. And it's a very boring graph, but it's kind of that's the point. Um, so then we looked at uh, actually generating Raman with the devices. And this is just one set of three spectra, one from each device, at one polarization. Uh, the reason why the pump wavelengths are a little bit different is because each cavity has a slightly different resonant wavelength. So the pump has to align with the resonant wavelength, so it's slightly different. Um, because the pump is different, the emission is different. So really what you care about is what the shift is, what the stoke shift is between the pump and the emission. Uh, but then, again, what we care about really are the threshold, the efficiency, reproducibility, and is there actually size dependence. So starting with the stoke shift. Uh, so if we look at all of our devices, the stoke shift is between 12 to 15 terahertz, which aligns with that SIOSI -SI vibrational bond. So that emission line that we're seeing there is, in fact, due to that vibrational bond. So that kind of checks that box. And that, of course, should be independent of all the other variables we're talking about. And it is. I also plotted in wave number, just the chemistic wave number. Um, then we looked at lasing efficiency. Um, 
the lasing efficiency for our hydroxyl coated devices, the threshold power and efficiency, kind of aligned with everybody else on the planet who'd ever done the same type of measurement before. But it, again, it's a control, it's a good sanity check. Um, for this particular data set, I think these were in like the 6% efficiencies, but there's another graph that has all the data. Um, but you can see there's really no difference in that slope for either polarization. Uh, for the methyl and the dimethyl coated devices, there's a very clear difference in the efficiency for the two polarizations. Um, and the threshold is about the same. Uh, it's actually a little bit lower than the hydroxyl coated devices. So in looking at this graph, what this tells me is that it doesn't, that, that second methyl group hanging on there isn't really doing anything, right? It's really that monolayer that's playing a role. There isn't kind of like a damping behavior from the methyl group or something. Yeah. So that the electric field is aligned with the SIO bond? So that's what we think, but we were never able to go through and like 100% verify it which is why we don't want to claim. So theoretically, yes, um, but experimentally, I, we didn't have a way to validate it. So theoretically, I can say that, right? Just like theoretically, I know that the reason why there's, I think I have it. Yeah, so Theoretically, the difference between the two efficiencies is about three to one, and that agrees with that, that if we go all the way back here, it agrees with this 3x between, right, so it, it agrees with that 3x difference based on those two polarizations. So the theory tells me that exactly what you're saying, the parallel versus perpendicular excitation. Between silicon and oxygen. Yes. Is that what's happening? Yeah. But I have no way of experimentally verifying that that is the exact mode that's doing that. It, it wouldn't make sense for it to be otherwise, but. Yes, exactly. I know it's where the electric field is oriented, but I, I did not controllably place. So I'm a very careful person with my claims. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to claim something that I am not 100% confident about what I'm claiming. Yeah, yeah, it is very not fashionable. Yeah, it is very not fashionable, but, but I also sleep well at night. So there's that. Okay, so. This is all of the data in terms of efficiency data. Um, I drew like arrows because this does have both like the smaller diameter and larger diameter devices. And for comparing efficiency, you really want to compare like the same size diameter to same size diameter. So the arrows are really just a, they aren't trying to like be a guide to the eye or something creepy like that. It's just to try to help you because there's a lot of data on here. Um, so the uh, smaller diameter devices either when you look at just the basic hydroxyl ones, if you look over at the methyl ones, either they had that kind of, still an improvement, um, that lower efficiency or significantly higher efficiency, and that significantly higher efficiency was in the low 40s to mid 40s range. Um, one thing that's notable about this is we only measured something called the unidirectional efficiency. So when we measured it, right, you couple power into the resonator and you can couple it either into the clockwise mode or the counterclockwise mode. And if you couple it into the counterclockwise mode, then it's going to emit light and it's going to go shooting back towards the laser. Now if you couple it, and so we would never detect light that was coupled back towards the laser. So that, that power is all lost. We could only expect to detect light that was coupled into the clockwise mode and like went towards OSA. So we would never expect to get efficiency that was above about 50%. So we were really excited to see something in the low 40s. Um, obviously, it is possible to build a setup where you can detect bi-directional efficiency and you get both sets of power. Um, you just need to put like a splitter and then split off your backwards light and then send that to an OSA and all of that. Yep. Or is there a way that you could do elliptical or circular polarization as well? 
You could. Yeah, you completely could. Um, you could do it both if you had like super special optical fiber, but you can also just do free space. You can do free space coupling, which will probably get a lot easier. Yeah. Efficiency goes up when you have a larger diameter resonator, 83 versus 53, or it could go either way. No, so that point, still don't know what that was all about, but you know, those are data. Um, so it's, it kind of stays the same. The efficiency doesn't really change. The efficiency is independent of device diameter, which is what you would expect. Right, but you expect to have more efficiency if the intensity inside the ring is closer to the surface. The, the peak of the intensity is closer so, to the surface. So at these diameters, the, uh, the optical field intensity, that mode profile, doesn't change that much. If we were going from like an 8 micron diameter device to like an 800 micron diameter device, that, that mode shape is going to change a lot. Here it's not, it's not changing that much. The mode shape isn't changing. The, the circulating power is changing, the circulating intensity is changing, but the lasing efficiency, the slope efficiency, isn't dependent on diameter. The threshold, this is dependent on diameter. The threshold power is very dependent on diameter. So, so the circulating power at the smaller diameter, larger diameter, smaller diameter, larger diameter. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like the optical modes inside the whispering gallery mode resonator. Um, would it be possible to like submerge it in like a fluid? Yep. To put the field closer to the monolayer? Yep. Yeah. Um, so there are all kinds of challenges that happen when you put them in fluids. Um, but it is definitely possible. Uh, if you are really excited about putting them in fluids, just for doing this kind of thing, I would suggest like it would be best to put them in something like a mineral oil because it doesn't evaporate as fast, right? Um, the biggest challenge with putting resonators in fluids is maintaining the quality factor because fluids are absorbing and they're painful that way. Um, the other challenge is actually being able to get your waveguide into the fluid. Um, fluids have really high surface tension and, and getting your waveguide into the fluid without it breaking as it's going from air into the fluid is really tricky. Um, so that, that's kind of the other challenge. It is totally possible. Um, so then we also uh, begin to notice with the increased efficiency that we also begin to see anti-Stokes emissions. Um, they weren't ideal spectrum, um, but we at least begin to see them. Uh, whereas at the same kind of input power levels, we didn't see anti-Stokes emissions with the silica devices. Let's talk about one more thing really fast, because really fast, it was kind of just, it was a fun project that we did more recently. I'm going to skip over this one. So for a very long time, I had a, a dream of making a, uh, a device that would be like a flower and would open up, and it would like optically open up, right? So it would, it would be a device, and then you would shoot light into it, and then it would it would get larger, and then there, because it had a diameter change, then the resonant wavelength would move, but then you could shoot a different wavelength of light, and then it would collapse, and then the resonant wavelength would go back, and you could do this over and over again. So in my mind, I had this like vision of how this would work. Okay. Um, and then I, I got two really, really smart chemists in the group. I hired them to, to like, make my dream come true. Um, it took them three and a half years. Okay, so even though it's like one paper, it was, it was worth it. Um, so the, the motivation behind this is the, the resonant wavelength is defined or controlled by either the refractive index or the device size. Usually when people are making devices to move the resonant wavelength around, they really focus on that refractive index term using something like the electro-optic coefficient if they want to move it quickly, or the thermo-optic coefficient if they want to move it slowly but with lower amounts of power. 
So I was curious if we could make like a molecular level switch that would be able to move it without requiring electrodes. So an all optical molecular level switch that we could put on the surface of our device and it would be able to move the refractive index around and be able to move the resonance around. So that was, that's kind of the dream. I also really wanted to just see if we could make the structure. Just, is this even possible? Um, so we started with this molecular structure. Um, it's an aazobenzene structure. It is light reactive. Um, so both heat as well as like a CO2 laser. Um, and blue light, so it goes from being in a cis to trans and then trans to cis, so it, like, it opens and closes. Um, and it does that in minute type time scales when it's in solution. And so we synthesize some of it in my lab. Then those little uh, red sites we stuck onto the surface of our device. We hit one really big hiccup the first time we did it, which is we put 100% of that surface of that chemical on our device and it folded and then it stayed there because it got completely tangled and it couldn't unfold. Uh, so then we had to come up with a way to put a little bit of that and then a little bit of something else on the surface so that it had some room to, to move. And coming up with a way to put two molecules on the surface of the device at the same time so to do a co-deposition of an organic chemistry and get uniform spacing, that ended up being the project. Even though that's like figure S2 in the manuscript. That was like two years of work, which is somewhat, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is it the benzene rings? Is it the dipole-dipole interaction? Like, what, what was causing the tangling to occur? It was, it was actually the physical tangling. Just the chains are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they would, like, fold and then, like, like stick. And then not, not unfold. Yeah. So, so we, we did AFM, and we could actually, like, tell it. Yeah. I'll tell Jing Han that. He's defending in August. So at the, now he has like a sense of humor. Because he's defending. So, so, so now like failures are like, yeah, that was fun. Because he has a job, he's defending. You look back fondly on your failures when you're like three months out, right? When you're like in the middle of them, not, not so fondly. Um, okay, so, so they figured out, and uh, Andre in the blue shirt, he works at Northrop Grumman. So. He also thinks that everything's funny now. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they figured out a way to deposit two things at the same time. And the other trick was actually adding in that um, benzene group with the chlorine to, like, add, like, a little bit of elevation to further add spacing. So not just lateral spacing, but vertical spacing as well. So it really created this, like, 3D structure on the surface of the device. And keep in mind, doing all of this while not killing our quality factor. So there's like multiple things happening here. Um, my dream, if you might remember, was I wanted to be able to do this, change the radius, and have that radius change be what actually changed the resonant wavelength. We did a bunch of DFT. It turned out uh, DFT is density functional theory. So different type of modeling, still modeling. It turned out that because our device sizes were so large, that the little tiny change in radius we were getting was going to change our, our wavelength by like a 10 to the negative 5, whereas the change in refractive index was a 10 to the negative 4 by whatever wavelength we were doing, so it was still going to be dominated by refractive index. Um, but if you used a smaller device, then radius change might dominate. So it could go either way. So we tested this tested our devices um, using uh, a pump, a modified pump probe setup. So we used a 1300 nanometer laser as our resonance, so our uh, probe. We then used a 410 nanometer laser as our blue source to make it switch one way. We used a CO2 laser, free space coming in to make it relax back. Uh, 
we combined our 1300 to 410 into a single tapered optical fiber where our tapered optical fiber operated at both 410 and 1300, which is like super special tapered optical fiber to operate at both of those wavelength ranges. So at 1300, it coupled light into the cavity using evanescent coupling. And at 410, it coupled light into the cavity via scattering. So it was two distinctly different mechanisms to actually get light into the cavity. Um, and the scattering-based coupling approach was actually uh, developed by a group in Tokyo, at Tokyo University. It, it, I just happened to be at a conference and like see a talk on it. And I was like, wow, so solution to our problems. Because we were trying to do like a dual taper approach and it was turning into a disaster. Um, so we looked at a bunch of different uh, ratios of that um, spacer group with our functional group and looked at the Q factors. Um, and all of our Qs, depending on if you were testing at 1300 or at 410, um, 1300, they were between about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. At 410, they were uh, more in the 10 to the 5 range. And that's because at 410, it was absorbing because that's what it was supposed to absorb at. So it was acting as a highly absorbing molecule. Um, so the first thing we did was actually show that we could switch it. Uh, so it has a very slow switch time. So when you put the blue 10 on, it slowly switches. Then when you hit it with the CO2 laser, it heats up and then it relaxes back to its starting state. So it unfolds, refolds, and goes back to ground zero. Um, we can do this reversibly multiple times. Um, so this is three times in a row. The reason for the slightly different uh, input powers is because the input power can vary slightly depending on how much coupled blue power we put in. So the power listed there is the blue power of the blue laser. The power of the CO2 laser stays the same. Um, we also took the device, put it in a drawer, waited six months, took it back out, and then checked to see if it still worked. Uh, be, so organic devices have a really bad reputation of dying. So we wanted to make sure that, like, will it still work the same after about six months? Um, so we just did the same test. The quality factor was about the same. Um, so the response was about the same, um, indicating that that molecular layer hadn't degraded. Um, you wouldn't expect that that molecular layer would have degraded because this is not a process that involves any kind of oxygenation reaction or something like that. So it shouldn't have degraded, but we have the data showing it didn't. Um, then uh, we took the kind of classic sensogram curves where we looked at putting coupling in different amounts of power and looking at exactly how large of a wavelength shift we could achieve. Um, and I've plotted it as a wavelength shift or refractive index change in the little insect. Um, and this, you can just convert to the uh, responsivity versus the uh, relative density of the responsive group on the surface. Um, and then that's the control where it doesn't do anything at all. So this, this has nothing to do with the actual device. So I'm going to stop there because I know some of you may be hungry, because I would be hungry um, if it was me. And I just want to thank all of you for you know, staying and also thank all my group members for doing everything. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? You said that blue light, 410 nanometer, couldn't be coupled into the red light? the gap is too large for that mm, Yes, yeah, so when you make a tapered optical fiber, it's you you optimize it for the wavelength that you're going to couple light into. Right? So the, the diameter um, is dependent on that wavelength because you're, the tapered optical fiber is basically an evanescent coupler, so your the diameter needs to be um, smaller than the wavelength of light you're using. So if your tapered optical fiber is designed for 1300 nanometers, and the diameter of your tapered fiber is going to be somewhere around a micron. But if your tapered fibers are around a micron, then 410, not, 410 light it isn't going to form an evanescent field. It's going to be fully confined. Um, so in making a tapered fiber that would operate from 410 through 1300 isn't possible if it's going to be an evanescent coupler that entire over that entire range. There has been some work done making a
poorly functional evanescent coupler with a longer range by creating like bent couplers. Mm -hmm. um, but even then they aren't spanning 900 nanometers. So 900 nanometers is really far, um, which is where this dual mode coupling came in. How did you accomplish the scattering then on the... On the, the scattering? Yeah. Yeah, so the scattering has to do with how you actually pull it. The actual pull <coughs> it. So you basically create these little tiny scattering sites. Kind of like little ripples along. Little ripples. It is... It's like glass blowing. <laughs> the first time my students showed me the data, I didn't believe them. And I said, that's not possible. I said, that's mathematically not possible. I don't know how you did it, but you're wrong. And I made them do it like 10 times because it went against everything I knew about coupling light into devices. It's like, you cannot use the same taper for both of those wavelengths. And they were like, no, no, but it works. And I was like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> I was like, you have to be wrong. You have, like, that's not possible. Um, and then I went and I watched them do it, and then I watched them couple. And I was like, okay, so now I have to figure this out. Like, why, how are you, what magic are you doing that is actually allowing this to happen? Uh, is, is there a way to model the vibrational modes for the Raman scattering for the, for the mono layer? <coughs> uh, like, is there a way to model that vibrational profile? Mm -hmm. Like, on the surface of the device? Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's like uh, finding what the displacement field would be and how that would overlap, overlap with the optical field. Did you do that type of model? I did not. Okay. Um, you were not the first person to ask me in the context of can I create a super, super special way of measuring surface chemistry, Raman angles, and surface density of molecules. You're not the first person to, to ask. Um, yeah, my, my understanding is that the vibrational modes tend to be more delocalized with respect to, especially uh, compared to like optical modes. Yep. But you have like this atomic monolayer, so I'm not sure what so, that profile would look like. Yeah, there is, there are ways to model it. Okay. Um, and if I get the chemistry postdoc that I want to, um, because the chemistry postdoc I had that was leading this project is now a professor um, and doesn't want to keep doing this work. He wants to do, he, he's like a chemistry professor that wants to go back to doing organic chemistry. Um, so I need to find another chemistry postdoc who I can make do optics and then do this again. Um, yeah, I would like to make a super special Raman spectrometer that can measure Raman monolayers. But we're going to need to do some modeling. And then also look at other surface monolayers. So if you have friends, you know? <laughs> Honestly, students are like the best sources of postdocs. <laughs> For the, uh, the monolayer deposition on the resonator, can you talk a little bit more about what the actual physical process is there? Oh, yeah. It's crazy. For us non-chemistry people? Yeah. Okay, so you take your wafer, you clean it. Um, you take your wafer, you clean it. Um, we... Like raw solution? Or like no. How clean are you talking about? Like <laughs> acetone, methanol, some DI water, nitrogen air gun. Okay. Um, so, I mean, clean it, right? Uh, then um, we usually put it in an oxygen plasma for a few minutes. Um, so our, our device, right, has a silica surface, so if we put it in oxygen plasma, we can kind of like bump up the density of hydroxyl groups. So we are putting it in the oxygen plasma as an, as an additional like treatment or cleaning step. We're actually, that's like step one of the surface chemistry, is that plasma step. So we put it in the oxygen plasma, um, and that, uh, this, this is actually like, you could put in here parentheses, O2 plasma, because that's to get like a really nice dense hydroxyl layer in O2 plasma. Then to do this, uh, we have a desiccator, like the glass bell jar, um, and we put the sample in there. We put a little beaker of either the, let's see, uh, this was TCMS, so trichloromethylsilane or DCMS, dichloral, 
dimethylsilane, GCDMS, um, and they're like liquids, so they're, and they're very volatile, so they will start evaporating just at normal room temperature. So you take maybe a milliliter, two milliliters of them, put them in a beaker, so if this is your desiccator, right? You put your wafer here, you pour like a milliliter or two into a beaker, put it there, seal it up, put, pull a vacuum on it, fill the bell jar, wait 20 minutes, I think, I think they settle in 20 minutes, and then pull a vacuum out, and then pull everything out. Do the whole thing in a fume pipe. Safety first. <laughs> Does that, that group have any sort of um, polarizability that you could try to leverage so that in that desiccation process you can uh, know something more about the orientation of that bond once it uh, fuses to the surface? So for this group, no. Um, we did also do it a, this, a similar XPS data. So I also talk about this work, but to chemists, and they like to see XPS data. Did you say who likes XPS data? No, I said I do. Oh, okay. Where is it? It should have been like right here. This means I might have accidentally deleted it. Well, this is the same thing. Um, so with this device, instead of using that um, trichloral, right, which just has a methyl group on there, we use this molecular structure, which has a chlorine, and then we attach this larger molecule. And so this molecular structure is has a polarizability moment to it. And in the XPS data, we were able to actually detect that. But it still doesn't really give us any sense of like orientation with respect to the optical field. So is the expectation then that the orientation is, is somewhat randomized across the surface? Or? Okay. Yeah. It's not perfectly aligned. But again, this is something that we haven't looked at um, at all. I knew it was in here. I knew it was in here. Yes. Yeah, so we did a control. See, this is a better control. We did a control where we put a chlorine tag on there so that we could verify with XPS that our surface chemistry was what we thought it was. And then this was what we actually did. Thanks. This is separate from the chlorine you added. Mm -hmm. Chlor Chlorosilane. Yes. Out of, out of yeah, yeah. This, this was when we first started doing the data, or started actually doing the surface chemistry. Um, so XPS, uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, is a way, is a really, really sensitive way of actually making sure when you put down a monolayer that the, the chemicals you put on the surface are actually the chemicals that are there. Um, the problem is, like in all spectroscopy methods, carbon's always there. Carbon's, carbon's, the bane of everybody's existence, right? XPS doesn't do such a great job with like hydrogen either. Um, so now we're trying to detect a monolayer of silicon and oxygen on a substrate that's silicon and oxygen. Which, yeah, yeah. that's, yeah, that, that is not detectable. Yeah. So, um, as a way to fix this, we put down the exact same like structure except we just stuck a giant chlorine on there as like a firework, right? Like, here, here is this chlorine, like, look for me. Because there shouldn't have been any chlorine on the substrate at all, so if we saw the chlorine peak, then we knew right. it was definitely there. Or if you didn't smell the gas, right, then it's still there. It's still there. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, so the, that's why we did that as a control. Because it was basically the exact same structure, but it had a, a little, like, flag that we could look for.
computer do the uh, Raman raising in like a different wavelengths where the cavity has like a anomalous dispersion? Do you mm -hmm. see the foreign mixing and Raman at the same time and be a way to control between the practice? Great question. <laughs> so um, we originally started the the project um, looking to see if we could uh, that that surface structuring layer was basically this intermediate step, right? And then we were going to put on a molecule that has like a high a high chi two or high chi three in order to do something exciting with it. Um, and when we started to see really really low threshold Raman, we started investigating that. Um, but this project is where we actually put on that really, really um, high Chi-3 molecule. So it was a, an organic material that was designed specifically to have a really high Chi-3. Uh, the dispersion of the device was not perfect. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but what became even more interesting was that the uh, dispersion of the material, even though it was just a monolayer, it actually really uh, altered the geometric dispersion of the device. Even though the device was, uh, was, was 138 microns and the monolayer was only a few nanometers, the, it actually really changed the optical behavior. Um, but we got really nice uh, four-way mixing out of the device. Um, and then we also got really clean, super low threshold uh, signal idler generation. And we've now sent these to um, some of our friends at uh, Information Sciences Institute, which is like a USC institute, and they showed that the photon pairs are correlated. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that was, uh, yes, we looked into that. Yeah. So, if you, um, in the like, uh, the Raman lasing experiment, mm -hmm. uh, do you always see the Raman uh, kind of dominate in for mixing? Yes, so in silica, the uh, Raman gain and the, and the four-way mixing thresholds are very, very similar. So they basically compete with each other. Um, when we put the uh, nanostructuring on the surface, that allowed the Raman gain to be increased. So now Raman dominated. And four-way mixing, it's not that it was quenched, it was just no longer preferred. So suddenly Raman was the preferred nonlinear behavior among the behaviors that could be possible. Um, if we made the devices much larger, we might have been able to play with that more. Um, but it just it changed the, the preference regime. Even at the anomalous expression regime? We didn't go all the way, we didn't make devices that were like 250 microns large. We didn't go all the way up there. Yeah. Um, towards the beginning of your talk, you were talking about how the spring gallery mode started with like the suspended mm -hmm. droplets and they moved towards microspheres and then yep. microtoroids to put your own chip. Um, and now there seems to be like a push towards active resonator devices. Um, is your group looking at like different geometries or different materials? And if not, like, are there any reasons why you would not want to move towards those? So we're looking at, um, so we aren't looking at different geometries. Um, so we're still st sticking with circular things um, because you need to have a circle, otherwise it's not a whispering gallery mode device. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. Okay. Um, just, I, uh, so we're, we're sticking with rings. Um, we are looking at silicon oxynitride devices, silicon nitride devices. Um, we published on silicon oxynitride devices too. Um, so that's like not a shock. Um, but we're looking at silicon oxynitride, silicon nitride. Um, I really like the research space of being able to leverage a lot of the advances in the chemistry world um, that were funded through the NSF Materials Genome Initiative which is like the chemistry version of the G human genome initiative, but there's a lot of 
science, like basic science chemistry research that hasn't moved out of the chemistry lab. And, and I think that's a really huge untapped area of potential. And it's just like waiting there for somebody to actually use all of this knowledge to do something with it. Um, so I, I view a silicon nitride micro ring as a, a board that I can paint on. So it's a really good platform. It's pretty well characterized. It's pretty easy to make. Um, and I can add function to them and have a really nice like toy system to play with. Uh, we're also looking at different types of couplers, like on-off chip couplers, grading couplers, things like that. Um, but I, I'm not necessarily super excited about going into like indium phosphide or aluminum nitride or any of those types of material systems. Um, there's still a lot of like material growth that has to get sorted out, and I don't want to build an MOCVD system. So I love people who have them. If anyone in here is doing it, but I. <laughs> I, I know my skill set, and MOCVD is not in my skill set. Um, so. I hope that answers your question. So with that, I think uh, let's thank our speaker, and I also have a.